Okay. Good afternoon. This is Alan Schimmel, editor in chief of DevOps.com. Welcome to another webinar in our continuing series here at DevOps.com. Uh, today's webinar is Swapping Engines in Flight, Transforming Brownfield Enterprise Applications. Today's webinar is brought to us, uh, is sponsored by Viz Vizitara, uh, and we will get into a little bit into exactly who Vizitara is. But be before we do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, our webinar today. Um, as application release velocity becomes a reality for the enterprise, DevOps professionals must consider how and when to transition Brownfield enterprise applications to an agile approach. With production applications on legacy infrastructure, how do you think about changing the engines on a flying plane? We have two great guests on our panel to discuss this today. The first is Rob Berger. Rob is currently an architect at MIST Systems and a noted visionary in the DevOps space. He has hands-on experience in automating and scaling startups, big data, and e-commerce. Uh, one of the things that separates Rob is his actual truly hands-on experience as a practitioner. Joining Rob is a actually a DevOps.com author as well as CTO of Vistara, uh, Varma Kuna Paraju, and I'm sure I messed that up, but Varma, I apologize. And, and Varma will actually be our host today as we, we take a deeper look at uh, Brownfield Enterprise applications and, as they say, switching engines in mid-flight. Um, before we go into that, though, I mentioned that Visitara is a sponsor of today's webinar. And for those of you who may not be familiar, Visitara is a cloud-based platform for IT operations lifecycle management. Uh, they They've been around for over five years, and they have over 1,100 end-user customers with over 100 partners. Um, they serve both the enterprise and service provider market, and are very proud to have been selected as a Gartner Cool Vendor in IT operations for 2014, and a cloud service management vendor by ESG in 2013. Um, so without further ado, I've introduced Varmer and Rob. Let me bring on our panelists. And, and we'll go from there. Rama, Rob, are you, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hello. Very good. And Rama? Hello. Hello. Okay. Good, good morning. Good afternoon. Wherever you people are. Rama, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thanks. Um, thanks, Alan, for having uh, me and Rob today as part of our continuing series on DevOps and DevOps-related uh, methodologies and processes for enterprise and enterprise adoption. Uh, before I proceed further, let me give a quick background about Vistara, and then uh, we will start the discussion. Vistara has been in business. We have uh, a pretty large enterprise customer base, and we have uh, cloud integrations, and today Vistara serves a variety of customers, both in traditional IT and IT operations management, as well as DevOps and cloud-oriented cloud customers. So today's topic uh, uh, to, to cover is enterprise needs broadly around DevOps. So as DevOps thinking becomes more mainstream, enterprises will need to incorporate new ways of developing and delivering applications into their standard IT processes. Enterprises are more complex and constrained with existing legacy infrastructure organizations and business processes that may dictate certain rules and regulations in terms of applying uh, application, continu continuous application development and continuous delivery. In our view of the world, enterprise apps fall into a, a broadly couple of categories. First is new applications and green trail applications that can take immediate advantage of DevOps principles, uh, just like most New Year's social networking, social gaming companies, um, namely the Facebooks, the LinkedIn, the Twitters of the world where they deploy the application many times a day, sometimes many times a month. Whereas the topic today uh, primarily is for those applications that may not fall into those green field, but they are 
trans that, that 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 needs to be transformed. Um, you know, because these applications are in production, they have been developed over eight, ten years ago, um, and they're not, they're fully baked and needs. Um, and the needs are driven by customer business needs um, and business users asking for rapid changes in those existing legacy applications. That's the broad topic. Um, to give a context on on what Vistara does in this um, in the in this new enterprise world where both legacy and new applications are coming, Vistara provides a unified command center to provide operational oversight across dev, test, and production, visibility into the entire application and service visibility, uh, availability to correlate application performance and changes with key events that are taking place underneath in the infrastructure. Um, Gartner projects that about 25% of the global 2,000 companies will embrace DevOps principles by 2016, and that brings the topic on how do we take advantage of these legacy application architectures that have been in place, that are in production in enterprises, and how do we kind of transform those applications to take advantage of some fundamental DevOps principles and, and the continuous integration and continuous deployment. Um, the topic today is how do we swap these engines and these brownfield applications in flight? Uh, without um, any further ado, first of all, thank you very much, Rob, for joining us uh, today on this uh, panel along with uh, Alan and me. Um, quick um, quick um, topic around brownfield. Applications, Rob. You know, what do you consider? What is brownfield applications in, in your mind, mean? <clears throat> well, again, thank you for having me. And uh, so, from my point of view, brownfield is, as you pretty much described, it's an existing, inf uh, existing application or service uh, that is in already in, in production and may have been in production for a long time, and uh, was probably built using previous generation tools and techniques, kind of serving the kind of old either mainframe or client server uh, architectures of, uh, you know, the last decade or so, um, or potentially even not that long ago, and it still could become, it's amazing how fast things can become legacy. Um, so the, the question is, I think, uh, you have these things, they're in production, they're serving customers, but now you need to evolve at modern web rates and web scale. How can you do that without having to completely uh, build something new before you can uh, use the new thing? You want to continue using the existing brownfield application and slowly transform it into a modern uh, web scale application. Great. So, um, uh, Rob, you know, in, in today, um, if you kind of look at these uh, current state of enterprise DevOps and enterprise uh, deployment of these existing applications, what I'm hoping to kind of do uh, with, a, with an interactive dialogue is to cover the topic of what is the current state of these uh, DevOps principles at enterprises, how does the roadmap and steps that one needs to do, and the challenges that one expects to face while converting these brownfield applications. And the best practices from your experience, Rob, you know, you have been uh, a hands-on DevOps architect and, you know, deployed the fundamental principles and touched a number of applications both in greenfield as well as existing applications. I'm hoping to kind of do an interactive dialogue around those topics along with your thoughts on What's next? You know, how do we kind of take this um, for much broader uh, adoption in uh, all kinds of enterprise existing applications? Well, <clears throat> so I think that uh, you know, um, DevOps is really a is a process and a, and a journey really. So different organizations are going to be at different stages of uh, becoming DevOps oriented. Um, 
so I think that one of the things that you know any organization has to do is look at their current, uh, both their architecture and their their organizational architecture, um, and decide how can they identify a, um, components that they can be migrated to a more DevOps style, and also at the same time identify the people and create the organization that uh, can adapt to this new way of doing things. Um, I think that's probably key more than even any technology is finding people that want to do this and, and having an organization that believes in doing it in a, a new way. Great. So, Rob, you know, how do you think about the different kinds of enterprise applications in the context of transforming to DevOps? Well, so, I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, probably as many different kinds of uh, situations as there are enterprises, but, um, you know, probably one of the big ones is uh, is a pre-existing custom application. Those are usually the kind that's really uh, wrapped around the whole organizational structure and the core business, um, you know, functionality. So these are both the most challenging kind of uh, application to transform, as well as the ones where you can give the highest reward um, to figuring out how to break that up and start uh, offering kind of either mobile applications or web applications, leveraging uh, the existing application, and then slowly transforming to the, the new way. Um, kind of related to that is would be packaged applications where you've you know, basically bought uh, a package application from a vendor. Um, in many ways, it's similar because they tend to get wrapped into your whole way of, of doing business. Um, in some of these cases, the, the vendors may have some paths to help you transform. In other cases, it's going to be pretty much the same as uh, a pre-existing custom application. You'll have to identify the, the most critical new business f functionality and start migrating that to, uh, um, to to kind of the new DevOps style. And we'll talk later about how some of the actual steps that we can take to do that. And then, of course, the you know, in some ways, the easiest is if it's a new, totally new application where you don't have to deal with legacy. So sometimes it's also called green fields. Um, this is where you can you know potentially have a uh, a team that you create to, to target the new application and start from fresh as a totally DevOps style with continuous integration, continuous delivery, test-driven development, and uh, you know, an organizational structure that reflects that. Great, great. You know, I think the first fundamental question that comes to an enterprise, um, particularly an enterprise application architects who are looking at the DevOps principle is to identify and, um, and and figure out what those applications look like. So can you give some common attributes that an enterprise should look at for finding the candidates for DevOps friendliness? <clears throat> so um, again, I think uh, identifying, um, so you have, you have these, usually these monolithic applications uh, they're serving a business need, but you're probably getting, um, you know, either your product managers or your your business uh, product people that are leading the the product direction, saying we've got to have this, we got to have that. Usually, something along the lines of we need to make it mobile friendly, we need to make it so it's, you know, the kind of systems that are internally accessible can be accessed through the web, uh, either for your own internal organization or um, for your customers. <clears throat> so, you know, if you were doing this from a kind of greenfield approach, you could immediately, uh, um, you know, start using the techniques that are available today. I think one of the biggest ones is, is having a loosely coupled architecture, uh, which is now today's being kind of called microservices. And in some ways this, might look like a you know the old service-oriented architecture, 
but really um, they're even more loosely coupled than, than those have. They tend to use REST um, as the primary way of, of the microservices communicating, uh, though we're also seeing now that uh, a lot of, uh, like if it's Internet of Things or, um, you know, web scale advertising, they're actually moving towards um, stream-based processing where you have uh, stream message buses like Kafka and um, uh, maybe even stream processing like Storm or Spark, Samza. Those are kind of tools that let you do stream-based microservices. Uh, that's probably not going to be directly applicable to many uh, existing services, but something to think about. And the microservice architecture allows you to kind of incrementally add these kind of new features. And then, of course, you know, you want to really, well, I think a, a fundamental um, thing that you have to always be driving for is to automate all things. If you're building, you know, individual servers by hand, then that's a good, sim a good indication that you're going to have problems. You want everything to be scripted or your infrastructure represented by code. And so using a configuration management system like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, um, things like that, uh, really should be at the core of, um, of, your, of how you're deploying those services. You have to expect that the services, the servers themselves, treat them as almost uh, immutable uh, things that you throw away when you want to update. And the only way you can do that is by automating the actual deployment. And that that goes right into the concept of continuous integration and continuous delivery, where that that's really the your application side uh, of this automation. You want to be able so that every time a software developer commits something to the Git repository or whatever service, whatever whatever revision control you're using, should automatically generate a new asset that could be deployed. Doesn't mean that you actually deploy it to production, but it should be automatically deployed to a QA service or something that actually gets tests run in in the context of your overall system. So those are, I think, some of the core things. And uh, just to again touch on, um, I don't know if you've heard of Conway's Law, but that says uh, that an organizations, any organization that designs systems is constrained to produce designs that are copies of the communication structures of that organization. So this really gets back to the fact that DevOps isn't just a technology or a technique. It has to be wired into your organization. If you have an organization that's made up of silos where developers throw the, their code over the wall to ops, that's not going to work. You really need, you know, DevOps really means dev and ops working together. And it really means end-to-end -end agile, where business, developers, operations, they're all really one organization that has a common set of goals. And so that's really the most important uh, thing they have to consider. And it's also the hardest. Yeah, no, no two questions. A great, great set of attributes that you outlined, Rob, there. You know, that brings up a very interesting question on uh, from a value proposition, if uh, an enterprise is looking at re-architecting and transforming these legacy applications, we're calling in this uh, webinar uh, brownfield applications to embrace DevOps architecture. So if you look at the value propositions for doing this journey, what comes to your mind, Rob? You know, why should um, you know an enterprise architect look at uh, the, the triggers that uh, is causing this re-architecting uh, re of transformation? Well, usually it's, um, it's a demand from your, your business, which uh, hopefully is a de you know, demand from your customers. Um, so you know, that's really what's going to be the, that should be the primary motivator of, of change. Um, and again, to actually be able to be responsive to these external demands, they may be internal as well if your customers are internal, but really um, the answer is to really break down these silos and improve the communication between all the parties involved. 
you know, that's, that is between, you know, you want to make it so that the information from the customers, marketing, and management is properly flowing to the developers and ops. And again, you have to, I mean, it's, you don't want to like literally have the, I mean, sometimes you can have the customers talking to developers, but you have to also modulate that so that the developers and, and your operations are not being jerked around. But that being said, you want to make it so that they really understand the business needs, and that's going to help make them focus on the right things. If they're not vested into the, what the business needs are, then they'll be building empires or, you know, doing things that are not necessarily going to be the things that uh, uh, make you able to satisfy your customer needs as responsibly as possible. Yeah, great point. I think, you know, this is where, you know, application demand and application evolution demand from business users is potentially could be a trigger is what you're saying. Like, you know, someone in the business unit wants an application that is not getting served on their mobile device or that is not getting served with a responsive design that allows them to use their iPads or iPhones or, you know, mobile uh, devices and, and now all of a sudden you're taking the monolithic application that was written you know five years ago ten years ago before the the new needs of rapid evolution came into picture and now uh, the business is demanding that and how do you take that demand and convert the demand in a in a way that not only allows the need met with a, a new the app principle that brings that app close to the business user, but in the process, transform it such that, you know, it becomes a, a DevOps-oriented, which will allow the application gets modernized uh, from both the principles of continuous integration and continuous deployment, but also from an operations point of view, right? Yeah, so, I mean, part of this is, uh, you know, so what you want to do is, you, or what you don't want to do is create a complete replacement for your existing legacy. I mean, your legacy system is probably, ser you know, you have customers, they are serving, you don't want to disrupt your existing business. But on the other hand, you want to be able to start um, mutating it so that you can meet the needs of the mo more modern demands, like particularly mobile is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, and uh, so again, I think what the first step would be to identify the, the things that are either in most demand or um, is going to give you the most uh, bang for the buck and figure out how you can still use, you know, almost like turn your legacy into a back end and create a, a, a decoupled front end that can still uh, that can then start evolving independently of the back end. Um, and again, that's going to need buy-in and commitment by the organization because on one hand, you're going to have the issue that the people that are continuing to maintain the legacy system might feel threatened or, you know, there's all sorts of interpersonal organizational issues that are going to come up. So you have to, again, you have to figure out how to do this in a way that, doesn't get you bogged down in the past, but it doesn't, you know, uh, have you disrupt your existing businesses at the same time. So this is kind of a juggling act, and you're going to probably want to identify a small team that will be start working on on the new system and still has to cooperate with the the people running the legacy system. So again, the, the probably the first step will be identify a way forward that would allow you to have some incremental change but not cause a flag day where you have to like one day shut down the old system and hope the new system's going to work. You want to be able to have both running at, this, at the same time for probably a pretty long time and slowly migrate to the new systems. Yeah, that brings up a good um, segue into the intricacies and maybe, you know, the next couple of minutes, uh, Rob, you know, if you can spend some time uh, with uh, tactical implementation and architectural considerations and the risks and the expenses involved in, in migrating these applications, if we can spend uh, a little bit of giving a background on 
to start with risks and expenses, right? Start for me. Yeah, I mean, you know, the let's start with risks involved in architectural considerations and, okay. uh, and the expenses involved in, in migrating these these legacy applications. So again, the, the uh, core idea is to identify kind of bite-sized systems that were uh, applications that could still lever your existing legacy, but can now start on an evolutionary path that's independent of the technologies and techniques that the legacy was built on. So this, for instance, it could be like, you know, a great opportunity to take advantage of cloud services, for instance. So your legacy system could be potentially in your own data center, um, you know, uh, on your own servers, but the new system can be, uh, in effect, like a little mini greenfield. And so you can take advantage of either literally public cloud, like Amazon or whatever, or, um, you know, internal cloud technologies, um, like OpenStack or something along those lines. Um, so if you do that, then you have to really, you know, start considering, you're still going to need to be able to potentially talk to your legacy environment. So somehow, you're, if let's say you're going to use public cloud, you're going to need, for instance, something like Amazon Direct Connect so that you can have a, a guaranteed latency connection between uh, your, your old data center and the new application. Um, uh, so but the, if you do the new application, that means that you can um, start doing things like base it on automation. So you should immediately start with uh, some mechanism that treats your infrastructure as code. Like I mentioned, things like Chef, Puppet, uh, Ansible. And personally, I'm a, a Chef kind of guy. Um, what I find is, uh, you know, what's really important is to use one of these. It's not so important which one you use. Um, and just lay it down from the beginning. Don't deploy, other than to just experiment, only deploy things through automation and assume that um, the automation will rule those servers. Again, this is really important. If you have people going and, and manually tweaking these servers, they should know that the automation is going to come along and wipe out whatever they did. So you really have to make that a foundation. Um, and that allows you to, uh, to start having kind of a policy-driven operations management. Your, your policies are embedded in the code. Um, you can even, uh, there's some nice tools now that allow you to literally deploy your configuration as a service. Things like uh, console, C-O-N-S-U-L from HashiCorp is a really nice distributed key value pair that uh, store a little bit like Zookeeper, but designed for distributed configuration. Uh, and either the applications can directly talk to that or it can drive uh, automatic creation of config files. Um, so that way you can really have it so that your policy is driven uh, from code. And as I mentioned before, um, microservices are, uh, I think, uh, a great model for creating a, a modular, uh, independently evolving set of, of services that form your overall application. You can think of each microservice as uh, a functional block, and it should literally be like a, in functional programming. It has very specific inputs and very specific outputs, and side effects should be e either non-existent or very minimal and controlled. Um, this, allow, this allows you to, um, to know precisely what's going on inside of each box and what, and the interoperation is through very explicit interfaces, either REST interfaces or streaming interfaces. And in both cases, you can have um, a schema rep repositories. So basically you define the schemas of either the REST data or the streaming data in a, a uh, schema repository, and that becomes the definition. 
and uh, of of how these microprocesses talk to each other, microservices talk to each other. Um, and this also gives you the opportunity to kind of wrap your legacy in a REST interface and make it available to these microservices. Um, so, you know, one of the first projects might be to basically take something like it could either be as simple as like a Sinatra app or it could be if you're a Java shop, it could be like Jersey, whatever, wrap your existing legacy with the REST service and that becomes your new interface to your legacy and then slowly but surely you can migrate um, components of your legacy to new microservices. Very interesting, uh, Rob. You know, that reminds me, uh, if you look at a uh, couple of decades ago when original micro, uh, before this whole open systems did not take place, this microservices brings me the memories of these legacy mainframe applications when um, those applications started migrating to open systems to take advantage of, you know, the early days of Sun Microsystems, Silicon Graphics, and all these mm -hmm. uh, Unix and uh, Solaris-oriented uh, applications that uh, most of the financial institutions, if you look at Wall Street, they all moved uh, in a very systematic way, uh, taking those ma mainframe applications, moving them to open systems. The whole analogy comes to my mind uh, because if you look at it at that time, the critical components of the transaction integrity, real-time performance needs, um, the, the fundamental business logic that was embedded in mainframe was kept in mainframe, but they took the entire layer of um, the user interactivity um, has been moved in the form of a publish subscribe messaging system, messaging, message queuing, and uh, message bus architectures to move to open systems. So do you see um, a similar thing that could one could think through uh, in, in transforming these monolithic legacy enterprise applications in today's world, even though they're running an open system, and converting them into the microservices architecture? Yeah, I really see this as a, a continuing evolution um, if we look at kind of that, that, that earlier, there's probably been at least two uh, major cycles of that in the past. Um, like the first one, like I kind of mentioned, when we went from kind of mainframes to client server, you know, kind of the Sun, Sun Microsystem style things, that was really about RPCs. And I don't know if you remember, like Cobra. Yeah. And, uh, and in some ways, you know, it, it is almost like a, a replay to some degree, but it's really also we learned a lot since those. So those, um, you know, Cobra, and then the, probably the next generation was um, uh, SOAP and yeah. SOA. Um, all these, uh, I think they were all important transformations, and we learned a lot. And if you really look at the evolution from from kind of Cobra to you know sort of really hard wired RPCs to SOAP, which at least you know, it was on top of HTTP, but it's, they both still were very complex and we were still learning a lot. So they, they were very complex kind of uh, uh, committee driven standards and they became very Baroque. Um, and since then we've learned to, to even make it more loosely coupled or, or to make it less tightly coupled. And I think the modern rest with JSON is um, and probably also I think we're just now seeing this this new streaming kind of approach coming out um, allows us to to have even less coupling less tight coupling between the the components. Uh, another big change I think is now uh, it's hard to imagine not taking advantage of open source. The the open source components that are available is like this vast toolkit and um, and the only reason that that is viable is because the components are less cut, tightly coupled so it's relatively easy to drop in uh, you know different kinds of, of tools even things as sophisticated as Hadoop and um, 
Storm and Spark to less you know complicated things that are just give you things like authentication, um, the, you know the, the database accesses that are available and everything from Postgres to, to MySQL up to the kind of Cassandra's and HBases. Uh, I think that's the other side is the fact that we have all this open source that's very high quality um, that we can really use as components. Um, and then the whole JavaScript world with Node and, and um, press servers, things like that, allow us to create very sophisticated end-user facing UIs that tie into this kind of REST backend. So I think that's, you know, that's really the, the transformation is it's been a series of evolutions to the point now where we really can have this, you know, we, we in the old days we talked about code reuse. And today we actually have that, but we it's not really thought of as code reuse. It's more like taking advantage of open source and building on the shoulders of other developers. Yeah. And you know, um, in, in some in some ways, the microservices world, since every um, every component uh, that can be reused is exposed in the microservice, uh, potentially leveraging the microservices really in some ways leveraging the code base which is delivering that microservice, right? Yes, but I don't think that's necessarily the um, the point of reuse. It's more like it's a more like a toolkit of of code that you can use mm -hmm. to build your very specific business applications that might be microservices. So you might not actually reuse the code from a microservice, but you can reuse the microservice by having it exactly. interconnected to to different other microservices. So you really end up building kind of this almost like a data flow system. Yeah, where, that's exactly you know, what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally. Now, now let's um, you know for for the in the interest of um, our audience today who who joined from enterprise applications background for this webinar, um, Rob, you know, would you mind taking um, a, a case study, a concrete case study, and I'm going to pose an application, you know, and, and, and give that as an example, and then we we take the journey of that application where where we transform the application over a sequence of steps to get to uh, with concrete tools that one would use or what concrete transformations that that one needs to go through to really make it DevOps centric in the new modern uh, application evolution. So let me start outlining the case study here. We uh, Let's go take a look at a monolithic application probably written eight to 10 years ago using standard Microsoft or, or open source technologies written in VC++ or Java, um, written as a large system integration, integration oriented project with a waterfall model where the application is specced out by a group of business users. There are program managers who manage those requirements, converted that into a, a RFP or a spec and invited a bunch of system integration development companies, you know, the Accentures, the CSCs of the world, went through a full-blown development cycle, you know, which took maybe a year or two years to develop the application. Not a single piece of the functionality is shown to the end user until the entire application is developed end-to-end -end, um, before it went live. Now, the application is live in production, um, but the needs of that application is now changing. This application is in production for 10 years, and the enterprise is facing the CFO, the management team is getting a continuous demand saying that the application has not been transformed, even though there are budget constraints not to kind of rewrite the application, but there are end user demands saying that um, this is monolithic, this has not been changing as rapidly as one. Uh, wants in this mobile responsive design needs, um, whereas the business logic component of this application that I'm outlining, Rob, is really constrained to certain fundamental business processes that got embedded in terms of workflows and things like that. But the whole application user experience is being like really 
needs transformate to because the, dem the demand for the business users are call it, calling for this. Can you take this as an example and, and walk us through the steps that one would do to take this application, decompose with the principles that you outlined, uh, the benefits that one would get, and how this translates to swapping engines that we are talking about during this webinar, uh, while not stopping the application, not really making the entire process halted to overhaul, but while the while the flight is in motion, how do you transform the engines so that it takes advantage of the uh, continuous development and continuous integration and the DevOps principle? Okay. <clears throat> so um, I think that, uh, <clears throat> again, the first step would be um, at the organizational level. I think what would be important is, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, identify the, uh, the most those critics that you need to deliver, in some ways it's just like a startup. You have to come up with what's your minimal viable product for this new uh, new thing that you want to do. It can't be a giant project, otherwise it'll just turn into another death march. So the first thing would be to, to find the smallest chunk that will give you the biggest bang for the buck. And something like a mobile interface to your existing system potentially could be uh, a nice nice thing to look look at because it's mostly about mapping the UI and potentially having the same business logic in the back end. <clears throat> so in that case, the first thing would probably be to, to create a, a small team. And I think that's something that has to be stressed is one of the successful, most successful indicators is having a, or successful approaches is to have a small team that has a mix of the right people to deliver this this uh, minimal viable product or MVP uh, and you want that team to be a you know have someone from your, your business group like a product manager um, uh, you develop the key developers and then like the ops people that will actually automate the creation of, of the service so again they're not people that are just going to you know jockey a server they have to be able to, to create the automation uh, so again Make you know, looking at Conway's law, create an organization that's going to be able to deliver this responsive uh, new mobile user interface. Um, then one of the first steps would be to create uh, to identify what services you need from the legacy system, and create a REST API around that uh, the legacy system that can expose. The, uh, the services from the legacy system to your new system. And this is probably one of the, the most critical ones, and it's going to require people that both understand the legacy system and understand the, um, uh, the new system. Again, depending on how that legacy system is created, it could be anything as easily as just intercepting, you know, if you already have a Java Beans architecture, wrapping a jersey around that, or it could be, you know, as, as complicated as having to talk directly to the whatever internal database it has. So that's going to probably be one of your your big variables is figuring out to how to so most gently and elegantly uh, wrap the REST interface around your your legacy. Because you want it so that the the new system just talks REST. It shouldn't know anything else about the internals of that legacy system. And you can also think of that REST API as something that eventually you could uh, start migrating other chunks of that legacy system into new systems, again, sort of abstracted by that REST interface. Once you do that, you can start designing your, your new service, which again, let's say is, is going to be kind of a, a mobile app that uh, allows you to do some of the functionality that your legacy system is being exposed to. Um, so now you can use any of the, you know, kind of modern tools. And again, I think microservices should be the foundation of whatever you do. Uh, so you have to identify what are the components, what are the things that can be considered independent and should be able to have their own life cycles independent of each other, only tied together by their, their REST or JSON interfaces. 
Um, and you can start building those either in parallel if you have enough people or in series. Ideally, you want to make it so that, uh, again, with the, the idea of a minimal viable product, every step, every, every, um, you know, hopefully you're doing things in like a one or two week cycle where every one or two weeks you can see some functionality or feature appearing. You, again, the worst thing you can do is have a project that takes six months to, you know, two years and you don't see any results for, uh, you know, more than a couple weeks. If you can see results and know that you're going step by step towards your goal, it increases the probability of success dramatically. And so as part of this, you should be, you know, you're going to have to be doing continuous integration. As I mentioned earlier, every developer push to, to, the, to your Git repo should be generating assets that get run in a, in a test environment. And your automation system should just be pulling those assets and building a QA or staging environment that you can be running tests against. So that's, uh, that's sort of the core kind of way to do it from my point of view. Great point. I think, you know, I'll do a, um, at this point, I'll give a case study, you know, we just recently came across uh, where um, they try to kind of do this just like what you outlined, Rob, for certain portions of the end user facing uh, application uh, UI. And they implemented it so effectively that these development organizations are pushing all of a sudden the changes to production through a process, and the application is evolving so fast and uh, furious to a point that, you know, the business users and the consumers of the application are saying, guys, you know, uh, this is going too rapidly for us, right? You know, if you implement it effectively, right? And if you kind of identify the things, the evolution is happening so fast that, you know, we don't want this many changes, you know, so fast because the development is continuously pushing the new new things. You know, often that is integrated, you know, gone are the days where the development through the code and, and, and the ops people are sitting on it and making sure, you know, the next production push is scheduled, you know, six six weeks out and with all the chain management processes and things like that around it. So if you if you implement it right, it is almost like, you know, we have seen case studies as where business users are saying, hold on, you know, this is evolving too rapidly. We wanted proper, you know, things. So I think I think the benefits of um, operational efficiency, um, the uh, the end user really um, getting the benefit of a rapid evolution that is coming. So if you look at those advantages and benefits in summary, um, and Rob, you know, in this kind of a world, what do you see hard benefits in transforming this kind of a case study that I, I mentioned, uh, taking this a case study of, though we are Saying it is a legacy application is only written about 10, 12, 13 years ago. From that point of view, it's a brownfield application. So, what do you kind of summarize as the benefit? Summarize as the what? Benefits of oh. um, the, okay. from an operations point of view, from a business user point of view. So, uh, just to touch on, um, again, uh, I think that the case that you mentioned where sometimes this could potentially be too fast for an organization. I think that it would be a mistake to say you shouldn't go fast and have fast iterations. What it might mean is that you um, you still have this kind of rapid deployment or de delivery. So again, that's why we call it continuous delivery, not continuous deployment. The idea is that you could still be delivering internally or even I would recommend that that there might even be a set of customers that are excited to have early stage releases. And so they could be your, you can think of it as alpha or beta customers, and these early fast releases could be exposed only to selected customers. Um, yep. And then you can have, you could still wrap a more traditional enterprise release cycle around that. But you should, I think it's really important to um, have this very fast uh, turnaround time from, you know, a feature creation to confirming that that feature is what's needed. Um, and it's important to have engagement 
with some customers. It doesn't have to be your entire customer base. Um, but uh, otherwise, you're sort of operating in a vacuum, and you don't really know if it's what the customer wants until you deliver it to them, which could be too late in a traditional cycle. Uh, I don't know if that answers yep. your question. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, continuous development doesn't mean continuous delivery to the business all the way to the business user. And that can be that can be scaled into uh, in, into phases and, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, and, and figure out what we should do. Okay. So um, we are I'm looking at the clock here. You know, we're coming uh, about 10 minutes away to the hour. Uh, at this point, um, Rob, unless you have any other points that we should, uh, you wanted to highlight, um, maybe we should uh, turn the table to uh, Alan and see if uh, there are questions. That'd be great. Hey, okay. Thank you, Varma. Thank you, Rob. That was a great discussion, guys. It was so packed full of uh, information. I'm, I'm sorry we didn't actually have it on slides because I think people would, would uh, benefit from it. What I'm, Varma, what I'm going to ask you to do, and, and, and the folks at this Tara, I know there was a companion a Google, Google Doc here, and uh, maybe we can pull some of these uh, ideas and, and, and discussion points off of that doc and we'll post those on devops.com as well. I think people will find that interesting in listening along to the uh, to the recording. You know, yep. I, I was trying to take notes but I just don't write that fast. <laughs> but it was really good stuff in here. All right, we're going to ask if anybody in the audience has questions. There is a, a, a question section of your go to webinar interface where you can uh, ask questions so if anybody would like to type in there um, I didn't see any questions coming in over the Twitter stream um, Rob let me ask you a question while we're waiting on that though and that is you know in a perfect world right we'd all like to be able to start with a nice fresh clean sheet of paper in a greenfield situation but but the fact is uh, the world wasn't born yesterday, and so most of the engagements we wind up with have some ground field elements to them. Even if it's a new application, the infrastructure and everything else is 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 legacy. And um, how many times are you seeing a company sort of change engines in flight, as as Robert eloquently put it, versus really just you know turning the page and starting fresh? Well, I, I think any any enterprise that has an existing customer base, um, you know, that that has uh, computer-based services, you know, is in that position where they they can't just throw it away. So I I think and and I you know even when I've been doing uh, startups, it's amazing how fast legacy can happen. Yeah, it piles on quick. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, so I mean I think that that you always will have to have deal with the fact that you need to figure out how to tran transition and usually you know every once in a while the right answer is to create something new and and have a flag day but I think that's a very rare and dangerous situation so you have to figure out how to do this kind of incremental transformation if you can. Got it. Then the next thing I, I you mentioned microservices in, in, in the discussion and it just so happened we had another article around microservices up on DevOps.com today. And inevitably whenever we mention microservices, a lot of views, a lot of buzz. Again, and you did it in it, but for people listening, what's your definition of microservices? Well uh, so basically the, the idea that each microservice can um, is, is as independent as possible. It should be considered a functional block that has inputs, tr a transformation that it does, and then an output. Um, and those inputs and outputs are clearly defined either as a REST interface with a JSON schema or uh, a streaming interface with a JSON schema. Uh, and when I say JSON, it could be Avro, 
you know, or it could even be protocol buffers or whatever, but some kind of explicit um, schema that, that describes, so again, the important thing is to describe its input is well-defined and its output is well-defined and what it does is well-defined and it should have minimal side effects. And that makes it into a building block that you can, you know, put these together to create an overall system. Got it. Got it. Excellent. Gentlemen, we're just in a minute or so before the top of the hour, and, and uh, it would be a good time to wrap up. Rob, if anyone wanted to follow up any questions or comments or reach you, is there a, is there a place, an email yeah. or something? Yeah, my, my email is uh, rberger, R-B-E-R-G-E-R, -E -E at mist.com. Okay. And, of course, Varma is CTO of Vistara. People can go to Vistara.com to get more information. But what about if they wanted to contact you? Uh, my email address is Varma, V-A-R-M-A, -A, at VistaraIT.com. VistaraIT.com. And, guys, are both of you on Twitter or anything like that? Yes. Uh, my Twitter handle is rberger, R-B-E-R-G-E-R. -E okay. Varma? My Twitter handle is Varma1, Varma1. Varma number one. one. Excellent. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being a guest on today's DevOps.com webinar sponsored by Vistara IT. And to our guests, thank you for joining us today. This is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thanks, and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.